Hello everyone, today we're going to discuss a new kind of compound statement called the conditional. Let's take a look at an example of a conditional. Suppose I make this promise to you. If I get paid, then I will give you $10. So if we let P equal I get paid, and we let Q equal, I will give you $10. Notice that the words that are connecting P and Q are those words, if, then. So in this connective, for this connective, there's a little word in the beginning and a word in the middle. And this is called a conditional statement. A conditional statement is always in the form if, p, then, q. So let's define it down here. I'm going to define it down here below. Definition. A conditional statement is a compound statement formed by connecting two simple statements with the words if p then Q. And the symbol for a conditional statement is an arrow. And we read this if P then Q, the way we read it here. So these two are the same here, what we have in quotes and what we have symbolically. Now, um, the simple statement that comes after if meaning the P, is the, called the antecedent. So we always look to see where the if is. And whatever is after the if and before the then is called the antecedent. Q is called the consequent. Now, sometimes when we write things in words, the antecedent and the consequent are not in order. We could say Q, comma, if P. So the antecedent here is at the end. So I, in words, when we translate in words, sometimes we put the antecedent at the end of the statement, as you, as you know in English. Okay. But the then, this, if we have Q, if P, it implies if P, then Q. Now, the question is, when is a conditional true and when is it false? Well, we have to look at the individual simple statements P and Q. So let's start with the conditional. If I get paid, then I will give you $10. This is my promise to you. And if I break my promise then the conditional is false. If I keep my promise and you don't have any reason to be upset with me, then the conditional is true. So let's look at these different, these four scenarios which will help us form our truth table. Okay, let's say I get paid and I give you $10. Well, that means I didn't break my promise. So I would be happy well, you would be happy, and the conditional is true. Okay, let's look at number two. I get paid, but I do not give you $10. Now, in this situation, you would be upset with me because I broke my promise. I did say that if I get paid, I'll give you $10. And I did get paid, but I didn't give you $10. So this scenario, we say the conditional is false. I broke my promise. Now let's look at the other two. And here we can debate about it, but 
will axiomize what the final result at the end. I do not get paid and I give you $10. Now let's think about that. Would you be upset with me in this scenario? I didn't get paid, but I gave you the $10 anyway. I don't think so. I think you'd be happy as long as you get your $10 or you, I, because I went over and beyond my promise. I didn't get paid, but I decided to give you the $10 anyway. So this is true. My, my promise isn't broken. And then finally, this scenario will definitely argue with you with, I don't get paid and I don't give you $10. Well, you're wondering why didn't Miss Basius not give me the $10? Well, I didn't get paid, so I didn't have the money to pay you. And I did say that if I did get paid, I'll give you the $10. So in this scenario, even though you didn't get the $10, and this is the only scenario where you don't get the $10, you wouldn't be upset with me because I did not get paid. So the promise isn't broken, and this is true. And this outlines the axiom for the truth table of a conditional. And if you notice, a conditional is more true than it is false. It's false under one condition. If the antecedent is true, this is the antecedent, and the consequent is not true, that is false. Otherwise, in every other scenario, the conditional is true. So let's summarize that on the next page. Okay, so our axiom, and remember, an axiom is a statement we assume true. true. It, says it says that, that a, conditional a conditional is a is false. Okay, because that's the there's only one condition where it's false. Only under one condition, and that is. When the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And remember, the word and is used here because it has to hold at the same time. Okay, and the truth table for the conditional, which we always like to summarize our axiom in a truth table, so we have P and Q, and if P, then Q. Remember, if P, then Q. Okay, that's how we read it. And if we have two simple statements, we said we have four rows and we're all going to begin the same way. Otherwise, we'll go crazy here. Two trues and two falses and then alternate true, false, true, false. So the line where the conditional would be false would be this line. When the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. So this is false. Otherwise... The conditional is true. In fact, I should have written that. Otherwise, the conditional is true. So when we look at a truth table for a conditional, we always have to look for the T for P and Q and false for Q. And there's our axiom for the conditional. Not obvious at all. Really very different. All right, next question. Is the conditional commutative? Well, in the, with the commutative property, we're investigating if Q then P. So we're asking if P then Q, is that logically equivalent to if Q then P? In other words, if we form a truth table for each of these, will we get the same answers? Well, let's extend the truth table in, in, on our page here. So I'm going to erase this. Okay. In fact, I'm going to try to squeeze it up here. If P, then Q. 
And I really don't want to make another truth table, so I'll just extend this one. And I'll do this in red, so you know it's an extension. And we're looking if Q, then P. Now, here, the antecedent is Q, and the consequent is P. So we have to look at the Q column first, and we have to look for when Q is true and P is false. Well, Q is true and P is false is here. And in that case, this row would be false. Otherwise, everything else is true. If true, then true is true. If false, then true is true. And if false, then false is true. Ooh, why is this erasing? I don't know what I did. That's strange. Okay, but the point is we see that these are not commutative. The answer is no. This is our first connective that's not commutative. We saw that the conjunction was commutative and the disjunction was commutative, but the conditional is not. So now let's ask, is the conditional associative? Oh, let me just write that in black. Is the conditional associative? That is to say, if we had three simple statements, if P, then Q, then R, and put this together, the first two together, is that logically equivalent to if P, then Q, then R, when we group these two together? Well, the only way to find out is to form a truth table. And uh, that I will leave up to you. But remember, this truth table would have eight rows. In fact, we could start setting it up. We'd have a P, a Q, an R. Okay, it's better if it's in line paper. And we look, work on the left side. So we make a column for if P, then Q. And that put, put that together with if P, then Q, then R. So that if P, then Q becomes the antecedent of this, this complicated conditional. And then we make a column for if Q, then R. And then put it together with if P, then Q, then R. And then so that the consequent of that conditional is if Q then R. So we look at the previous column and see if these are logically equivalent. And remember, when we write the truth values for P, Q, and R, we start with four trues, four falses. I'll write four false here. Then we go true, true, false, false, etc., alternating. And then this is true, false, true, false. Okay? And fill in that uh, truth table and see what happens. And let's see what our um, conclusion would be. Okay, let's move on to the next page. So there is a sheet attached to your homework tonight. And these problems are directly from the sheet. So you may like to write 8A, 8D, and 8E. But I rewrote them here anyway, just in case you do not have that sheet. And when we get to logical proofs, it's very important to translate a conditional into symbols. But before we do that, sometimes we have to write, rewrite the sentence in the if P then Q format, where the if is first and the then is second. So we could clearly identify the antecedent and the consequent. So let's look at 8A. A squared equals 9 if A is equal to negative 3. Well, to write that, notice that I look for the word if. The then isn't there because it's implied. So I see the word if here. So I would think that this is my antecedent. And I would say if a is equal to negative 3, then a squared equals 9. So that would be my, my conventional format. Okay, I'd like you to try 8D and 8E by yourselves. And in 8D, there's, we don't see an if and we don't see a then at all. But I want you to think about where you could put the if and the then if you were to rewrite it. And the same is true for 8E. All right, so pause the video and try it. 
Now in AD, Tom dates Sally when Mary is out of town. That's horrible, but okay. But we could rewrite this as the following. When does Tom date Sally? When Mary's out of town. So if Mary's out of town, then Tom dates Sally. Okay. So here, the antecedent is Mary's out of town. And the consequent is Tom dates Sally. All right, in the next one, I have a little bit more than just a conditional. If we look at it, it says, oranges are green if Scott Joplin was a painter and July 4th comes in December. So I see two connectives. I see if and I see and. So here, because anything that goes after the if would be would imply that it's the antecedent, we could rewrite this as if Scott Joplin was a painter and July 4th comes in December, and even though it's not written, the then is implied. Then oranges are green. Oh, I misspelled green there. Okay, then oranges are green. Oops. Can't see. Okay, green. Okay, here we go. Notice that the antecedent for this conditional, the major connective is if then. But the antecedent for this particular conditional is a conjunction. Okay, that's where we go into more complicated compound statements. So you could have a conjunction or a disjunction as the antecedent or consequent or even both in a conditional. All right, let's practice translate now, translating words into symbols. Okay, this is problem 9E on your sheet. And again, if you have the sheet in front of you, you don't need to copy this down and just follow along. Okay, now here we're given that if bears hibernate in the winter, then they do not eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast. And we're given the letters C, H, and S. Now, usually the letters go with the simple statement. I think we're given C, H, and S. So, um, oh wait, actually I wrote the wrong ones. It's, I'm sorry, I wrote the wrong ones here. This should be, uh, I looked at F. This should be H and C. Okay, we have to use H and C. So H would represent bears hibernate in the winter. C would represent bears eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast. So whenever we have a letter that represents a simple statement, we always assume it's the affirmative case. In other words, don't assume that they are the false statements. They're always the true statements. So H is bears hibernate in the winter. C is bears eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast. So we look for our connectives. We see the if, we see the then, this one is very clear, but we also see a not. So that's where we would have to negate the simple statement. So let's do it, let's it's like translating English into math. So if bears hibernate in the winter is the antecedent. So that's H. If H, then they do not eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast. Well, if C represents that they do eat crunchy wunchies, we have to negate it. And there's our conditional. All right, let's try another one. And the next problem is 9F. If I eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast and if I, I graduated from Harvard then I am bound to be successful. And we're using the letters C, H, and S. So again, C means I eat crunchy wunchies, H is I graduate from Harvard, and S is I am successful, or I am bound to be successful. All right, now what's tricky here in this problem is that we have if repeated. 
Notice it says, if I eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast and if I graduated from Harvard. Now, in this problem, the if repeats twice before we could get to the then statement. So for every if, there has to be one then. So let's see, can we rephrase this so the if appears once and the then once? Well, the then is already here once, so we don't have to worry about that. So how would we rephrase this first statement, do you think? This part, if I eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast and if I graduated from Harvard. How can we write that as one if? Well, I would think it would be if I eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast and graduated from Harvard, then. So in this problem, the antecedent is a conjunction. So we could say, I eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast and I graduated from Harvard. This is the antecedent. So if I eat crunchy wunchies for breakfast and graduate from Harvard, then I am bound to be successful. So notice that the antecedent here is a conjunction. And that's where things get a little tricky. And that's where we could debate a lot. Let's try another one. This next problem is nine letter O. And I wrote it out for you. It's really very long. And I hope I copied it correctly. I'm just going to read it back to make sure it's correct. Um, if Sally did not attend Yale... Or if bees do not hibernate in the winter, then, okay, there's a comma after winter, then either Shakespeare ate crunchy wunchies for breakfast, comma, or he was a fool. So we're going to use the letters S, B, C, F. All right. Now, this is the major connective is a conditional. But the antecedent and consequent are a little bit more complicated. So try to translate this using the parentheses in the appropriate places. Okay, pause the video and try it, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so starting to go over this, if, okay, the if is in the beginning, so that's good. But there's another if here, and just like in the other problem, I could combine these and put Sally, if Sally did not attend Yale or bees do not hibernate in the winter, would be the full antecedent. So this would be the antecedent, or bees do not hibernate in the winter. So we would write, if Sally did not attend Yale, so we have to put down not S because she didn't attend, right? Or, so we put the disjunction, bees do not hibernate in the winter. So I put not B for the, the negation. And this is the antecedent. And note that we negate each because there's a not there. Okay, that's the only reason why I'm negating it. All right, then what? Then, okay, here we go. Then either... Da, 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 da. So this word either or, whenever you see the phrase either or, we definitely use parentheses. Then, either. Okay, so let's put the or in there. Then either Shakespeare ate cr crunchy wunchies for breakfast. That's C. Or he is a fool. F. And that would translate that sentence. So that one's a little complicated. And here, parentheses are very important in logic because without them, it's a different statement and there's no order of operation. So we have to we have to figure out the parentheses first and then put it all together. All right, let's try one more. OK, this next problem is 9R and it says if there are not too many hogs in Kansas and if Mary attended Wesley. I put the tens, it doesn't matter. Then bears are not fools. And we're using the, the letters H, M, and B. So again, we look for the connective and we have um, if and then. Okay, and I have two ifs. So again, I could combine the first two. And it would be, okay, we need parentheses in the first one. 
if there are not too many hogs in Kansas, so the not too many, I have to negate H because H means there are too many hogs in Kansas. And Mary attends Wesley, so that's M. Then bears are not fools, so I put not B. And that's how we would translate the last one. Okay, so that's enough with the translation. Let's do a truth table and we'll end the lesson. In number 24 on the sheet, they ask us to complete this truth table. Here we're, we're combining a, a disjunction with a conditional. So take a minute and fill this out. Now remember that the P column begins with two trues, two falses, and then we alternate with the Q column starting with true, and we'll always label it this way. A disjunction is more true than it's false. And remember from the axiom we said, a disjunction is false only when both disjuncts are false, otherwise it's true. Now, this disjunction is a consequent here. So we're going to look at these two columns where P is the antecedent and P or Q is the consequent. So let's see, a conditional is false when its antecedent is true. So I have the first two rows. And its consequent is false. So let's see, in this row here, I've got true, if true, then true, but that's true. In the second row, I've got if true, then true. That's still true. In the third row, I get, I have if false, then true. But we said that that was true because the antecedent has to be true and the consequence false. And then finally, if false, then false is also true. This is a very special compound statement. It's always true. And a compound statement that's always true um, despite the truth values of its individual simple statements, it's called a tautology. Let's define that. A tautology is a compound statement that is always true regardless of regardless of the truth values truth oops I, I messed up here i can't believe i'm making mistakes writing this is supposed to be typing the truth values of its simple statements so if p then P or Q is a tautology. So if P is true, then the disjunction's always true. And we have a lot of tautologies that you even encountered in English. For instance, for Shakespeare, the very, very um, famous statement is to be or not to be. That is the question. Well, this can be translated translated as P or not P. And if you, we make a truth table just for that, we see something very interesting. And again, there's only one simple statement here. So it's either true, false, false, true. And then here, at least one simple statement's true. So this is always true. So this is a tautology. So Shakespeare knew that the answer to his question is always true. But if we put and here, okay, things are different because you can't be and not be at the same time. I mean, that's impossible. And if you look at it using logic, um, here, when at, if at least one simple statement is false, so the entire conjunction is false. When a statement is always false, we call it a contradiction.
I should say when a compound statement, because it gets confusing, when a compound statement is always false. Despite the truth values of its of its simple statements, is called a contradiction. So, in life, we're more interested in tautologies than we are. In, with contradictions, even though they do pop up once in a while. And in logic, the best way to prove a tautology is to make a truth table. I mean, there's no argument against that. All right. So that takes care of our lesson for today. And I wish you a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care now. Bye.